still is. <laughs> okay. We're a little late, but we're here. And we're going to get started. I'm Matt Lyman. I'm a member of the board on, in the Thomas Mason Lyman Educational and Historical Society. And that is a mouthful. Uh, we're here to hear the presentation from Gary Bishop and Brent Lyman on Albert R. Lyman's life and writings. And this is worth coming to the expo just for this presentation. I'll bet they could take four or five hours on it. I, I don't know, who's first? Grant. Grant, we'll turn the time over to Brent Lyman then. Thank you. I wear my hat not to be rude, but I have a condition called involuntary blepharospasm. Anybody know what that mouthful means? That means that I have a tendency to blink constantly. Every 90 days, I get Botox shots to help that. But wearing a hat helps me to keep my eyes open. They told me when I started taking Botox shots that it made me look like Paul Newman, but I'm kind of waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little louder? I'm a little louder. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm a little deep, but I make up for it by being a little blind. <laughs> Let me tell you just a little bit about the, what I'm going to do. I'm going to review mostly out of this book, The Great Adventure. I published it first in along about 68 uh, as a paperback, and then I married Jeannie, and we immediately published it a second publication. Gary has taken that and made it a beautiful book. If you look carefully on the back side, you see a watermark here of a woman. I'll tell you about that woman today. <laughs> the, the Great Adventure, when I published it the first time in about 68, I was down at Grandpa's house. In the and he said at that time, I consider this to be my greatest writing. And more value than anything else I have written. Uh, at the time, I, I thought, wow, that's a good thing to write. I just write a number of his books. Uh, and I'm going to be referring to my notes here from time to time. And if you have a question, Speak louder still? Yes. Okay. Very good. I don't have any trouble speaking louder. In fact, I'm sometimes I'm not to speak too loud. <laughs> Maybe if I start on page one to page three, it'll make more sense. As I pondered about how to present this life story of Albert R. Lyman, lived 93 years. How do you encapsulate a man's life? 93 years in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And as I pondered about it, I felt that he whispered, or someone whispered, say what he would like you to say. And as I prepared, I tried to bear that in mind. And the first thing that I would say is, as human beings, and this is how we're talking. As human beings, we don't have the power to complete a communication. <clears throat> By that I mean, we don't have the power to convince people that what we're saying is true. We bear testimony, we bear witness, and still in our courts, we often plead the guilty and imprison the innocent because we don't have that second half. We don't have that power to convince people that what we're saying is true, though we may know it's true. We don't have that power. The Lord isn't so handicapped. The Holy Ghost isn't so handicapped. So today, I would invite you, as you hear what Albert R. has to say, or what I have to say here, I invite you to open your hearts and your minds and invite the Holy Ghost to tell you this is true or this is not. The choice is yours. It's <clears throat> How many 
of you have heard Albert Arlen speak? Oh, good, good. You may recognize this a little bit. As I was preparing this, I, I said, well, why don't you, the thought came to me, why don't you show them? So I thought I'd give you just a little taste of what Albert R. Lyman sounded like there. Uh, remember, he, he's from San Juan, but in spite of being from San Juan, he, he didn't ride horses, raise a car, and afraid of the law. <laughs> <laughs> he rode horses, raised corn, and prayed to the Lord. Yeah. There we were, away off out there in the brush, a hundred miles from help of any kind, and out of the cedars and the pinion rode this little bunch of pine. Mischief clearly written on their faces. I love to listen to Albert R. And many times he would give an opening salvo like that and just give us, grab the attention of the people. And, uh, he was a tremendous speaker. Now let's start with first his, much of his philosophy. It was there. And then the book consists of the whole first chapter is about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We'll get there in just a minute. But <clears throat> the great adventure started actually before we were there, and he says, <clears throat> we are here in mortality to become powerful, to learn to control our bodies as well as to submit our will to the will of him who has the power to guide us to perfection and exaltation. The spirit without the body is not nearly as powerful as a spirit inseparably connected to a body. In the pre-existence, we saw our heavenly parents. We saw the power they had. And we wanted to be like them. We wanted the power, the body, the things that they had. We jumped up and down and shouted for joy when they gave us the plan. The plan of happiness, the plan of salvation, the plan of achieving that power. In the Garden of Eden, <coughs> Adam and Eve, Grandpa fell, were there for a long time before Satan was allowed in. He was out there, but not in the Garden of Eden. He suggests that perhaps they were there for millennia of time. In that time, though, when they were there, it was a very perfected place for the first wives. You will recall they were they were barefoot. They were bare period. And there was no danger to their bodies of being hurt, no matter where they went or what they did. There. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan was allowed to come in, there, let's review that for just a minute, because there's some real lessons to be gained from, from this. As we understand, Satan came first to Adam, and he just dismissed him summarily. I'm not, I'm not listening to you, I'm not doing this. Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, could, were commanded, their first commandment, have children. They couldn't. Eve makes this quite clear when after the fall, she says, were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed or children. So we need to, in my, my opinion, as well as Albert R. he mentioned, let us revere Eve. She obviously thought a great deal about this commandment and about this problem. 
I don't deny Jennifer's lady there is difference. She knew that they weren't able to have children with just the first commandment. Knowing this thing, this much at least, she ventured and partook of the fruit that caused the change in our mortal body that allowed us. What a marvelous tribute to our mother Eve. When they were cast out of the Garden of Eden, they remembered all the wonderful things that had happened there. And I imagine like many unlearned children in this new environment that they often said, we need this, we need that, we're having this trouble. As they turned back toward the gate, the closed gate of the Garden of Eden, and they didn't get an answer. They didn't get an answer until finally, and this is my opinion, and I find it in the innuendos of authors, until they kept the rule of prayer. Do you realize the prayer had a rule? Do you know the rule? Sincerity and commitment. I can hear Adam Crane. If you'll help us, we'll do what you ask us to do. And the Lord commanded them to offer sacrifice. Another long time goes by. And the angel comes and says, what are you doing? Well, I don't really know, except I've been told to do this. During this time, children are born. Now, here's a great paradox. Adam and Eve remember Eden. They know what, who they're worshiping. They know what it was like and who God is. But these kids don't. And Adam and Eve don't know, how, don't know what to tell them. They're cast out. They don't have the experience that Adam and Eve had, and it's hurting them. Finally, at the time when the angel comes, they feel the grasp. They get the understanding of the atonement. Can you imagine how exciting that would have been for them? But we know. We know what to tell them. We know about the atonement. We know how to get out of this fix we're in down here. What a wonderful excitement that must have been for them. At this time, the scriptures tell us Satan, after they had taught them the gospel, Satan came among them and said, Believe it not. For they believe it not. They're in a hurry or we won't even get out of the garden of Eden. <laughs> All Albert's life, he felt, was compared to the experience we just talked about. When he was nine years old, he was in Fillmore at the home of his mother, Adelia Robinson nine years old, and they were playing in the yard, a bunch of kids. And up to that time in his life, Albert R. had, had, had been able to see a glow. He could hear music. Any of you who have read some of the NDEs, if they're sincere and right, the people have generally heard after they pass through the veil. They've heard this music. Some don't recognize it immediately. But they've heard this music. Albert R. all of his life has recognized this glow of beauty, this halo that seems to cover everything. When he was nine years old, playing here in Fillmore in the front yard of Brother Robinson, suddenly, while he was playing, that light disappeared. Not partially. It just disappeared, and suddenly he realized the world is drab. It's not pretty. And he couldn't wait till they got back home to Scipio that evening to get up into his little trundle bed up under the eaves in the attic to hear the music again. And he cried. He said, it's no use to him. The next day it was drab. And it so affected him all of his life long. This, this thing, 
this understanding, this beauty of Heavenly Father and His work bother you? And after what? Satan came to him and said, He didn't do this and that. Never happened. And Albert began to think, Well, in this world, things can happen without any purpose. This was possibly, probably his greatest test. All of you who are Shakespeare fans know, with the exception of Romeo and Juliet, each one of the major characters had within them a fatal flaw. Some of them followed, some of them overcame it. We also have a fatal flaw that if we follow it, we'll, we'll lose it. And this was Grandpa's fatal flaw. His, his temptation that he, he couldn't understand. Why is this so? And he began to disbelieve. When he was 11, he went out on the range on what's called, I call it Pagarit. Some of you may pronounce it Pagarit, P-A-G-A-H-R-I-T, Pagarit. And this Pagarit is the wedge of, ground, of land between the San Juan River and the Colorado River. This is where his father, Flatby the first, ran his cattle. And because they were poor, Albert R. went with him, left school, and went with him when he was 11 years old. He was excited to go. He was filling the part of a man. And he hoped maybe this would fill that void that he so felt in his life. He got out there, and the Lord seemed to disappoint him. Dead cattle. No rain. Horrible things. The first of which well, he was an experience he had at Hogs Crossing. And if any of you have been to Hogs, you know where that is? That's not where it was. Now it's way off up the country. It used to be right down there, just the river between it and, and Bullfrog. They were called those by those names at that time. <clears throat> and they came down there, a man on the other side of the Colorado River owed flat some cattle, and he was going to pay his debt with 50 head of cattle. The river was running swift. They got down there and realized they couldn't get across the river. They then flattened there were some prospectors up the river. They went up and borrowed their boat. He went on across and he was gone for a long time, almost all the rest of the day. This was the first great spiritual experience that Albert R. had. He had so loved his dad. And let me tell you here why he so loved his father. Before they left to come down the home and off, Three of the four of Albert and Adelia's children died right there in Oak City. The only one that made it on down was Aunt Dolly. She was Albert's older sister. Albert wasn't born yet when they left to come. And the first, flat, or the second Flat D lineman, Flat D Alton lineman, when he died, Flat D had grieved so greatly that his mother said, I've never seen a man grieve so much over a child as he did. When Albert R. came along on January 10th, 1880, it filled that void for Flat D. And he treasured his son. Now at that point, the only son he could have. The rest of his children were dead. This love was felt by Albert R. and so reciprocated that in spite of these things which led to atheism, no other way to say it, as Albert looked, this is a world of caprice and chance. Anything can happen. But Albert loved his father with all his heart. And long about three o'clock in the afternoon, his dad had been gone now for five or six hours. Albert had been seized with a panic. And you can only, you know who's helping him in this panic. And increasingly, so he just literally went bananas. Finally, he grabbed the, his little pony, Stripes was his name, and forced it into the river and got out just a little ways in the river, in the river, and Stripes started to float away. Albert got scared and let go of the reins and grabbed the mane and came back. He tried it again, same thing. But it had a great big old tall pack horse. Albert got he did. So he got on that old pack horse. They went out until the pack horse started to float away. 
now they're out farther and deeper. They go backwards, brought them back again to the shore. Now he just so he knows something's happened to his dad. He's in trouble. And he finally Albert throws himself onto the sand, realizing I only have one alternate left. And that's the grave, in spite of the fact that I don't believe in it. He threw himself down, and the only word he said was, Oh, Father. Oh, Father. During the next 10, 15, <coughs> excuse me, during the next 10 or 15 minutes, a peace came over him. And while he didn't hear a voice, he felt a voice saying, You have allowed yourself to become too excited. Your father's fine. He'll be back. Just before sundown, he saw his father come out of the willows on the other side, get us into the boat, and come back over. Yeah. The next day, that it's a thrilling story, and Flat brought the cattle across the river the next day. And Albert said, I know. I know now there is a God. And within a few days, they were out following up the canyon and were thirsty, very thirsty. And they came upon a cow that had its horns and got his head down through a hole in the rock to get a little bit of water down there and got the horns off and died. Knees all scraped down to the bone and so forth. And it infuriated out here again. And he thought, this is just the worst. And they themselves were thirsty this same day. And they went on up and there was some seeping water. They had a little pool back under a ledge. <clears throat> and Albert tried to get his head back in there and his father said, don't go through there. Into the cow. And he made a flat made a straw out of a willow. Do any of you know how to do that? A whipping willow, the, the bark, just under the bark, the wood is so slick from the satin that if you take, take a pocket knife and tap the willow, it'll loosen that skin on the willow. You can cut it off, you can make it whistle, you can make anything. They made a straw, flat made a straw about that long. And they were able to get back in and get a drink. And Flat said to Albert, thank the Lord for a drink of water. Albert thought, the Lord has nothing to do with it. My dad? How he loved his dad. Let me jump on the way there. There were several things like this, including a major cattle drive where they thought it would rain in, in April. It didn't. It didn't rain in June. It didn't rain in July. It didn't rain in August. And the story of the trip up over the mountain trying to bring these cattle, they lost many more than half of them from starvation and thirst. Each time they'd go to a new water hole, they'd find either it was dry or there were dead cattle there. there. Albert's atheism grew. This was a real problem, and his father knew it. He could understand it. The rest of, of Albert's life. One or two or three things I'll talk about. Do I have five minutes? Because it starts with 10 after, so I don't have five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, 30. I said you didn't have five minutes. <clears throat> In working with his father for the cattle, he had a, the, his second great spiritual experience. And this time he didn't forget it and didn't, but he still was uncertain about it. He was riding down west of Bluff, just north of Bluff. It's a big long bench, runs for some 15 miles, and then there's a big reef, a rock reef. He was riding down through there and down through that rock reef, and he had a vision. A little woman appeared before him with two little children, one by her side and one on her lap. And he studied that. He knew this is, she's mine. The children are mine. He doesn't even have a girlfriend. But he knows that this is so. And this woman figures in all of his dealings. Later he rode to get help from Bluff up to just south of Monticello, on to what's called Dodge, to bring back a girl whose name was Lel. Her name was actually Mary Ellen, but one of her younger 
and younger siblings didn't say Mariel and then didn't Mariel and she became loud too. He went up together to Lel because one of Lel's younger siblings had fallen in a tub of hot brine. And he went up there and moved them up. They rode together for some 45 miles. And Albert and Lel <coughs> fell in love. Later Christmas, they were together again. Albert I got called on a mission to follow his father, who was mission president in England. Mission President of all Europe. Albert followed his father. On his farewell, Albert said this, so we know his testimony still is not deep as we know Albert are. Testimony to be. In, at his farewell, he said, if I find something that seems to make more sense to me than Mormonism, I will embrace it and join it. In his farewell, he went to England. Not long after he got there, he was called on to speak at a, at a street meeting. And, the, and just as he was called to speak, he was told he was going to be the main speaker and a brand new missionary, a relatively new, scared to death. And here come all these aristocrats out of an Episcopalian church, all these handsome cats. You know what a handsome cat is? It's a, a cart, a horse-drawn cart, but it has glass all around it. It's enclosed. It's the rich man's buggy. <coughs> All of these people are pouring out, and he's introduced as the principal speaker. He had prayed, he had fasted, he had studied. And in that moment, when he needed the help so badly, it came. His soul was filled with the Spirit, he said. He quoted scripture that he had only vaguely read. He spoke with such power for 30 minutes that when he <clears throat> finished, the jeering had all quieted down. He said, watch them leave quietly. And at that point, Albert said, I am leaving. And he never got it from that point on. But he got sick on his mission, came home, came home early from his mission, very sick. His mother, when she saw him, said, you'll never look worse if you're in the casket in your coffin. Very sick. When he met Lel again, his comment to her, his introduction again to her was so cold, he said they hurt still to this day in writing the story. Lel, it has been said, my cousin Clayson said, Lel's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I agree. And Albert R. agrees. He, while he was on his mission, uh, Another, she had gone to see Lel, had gone to Cedar City, take care of an aging grandfather. And a missionary from Cedar City came to London and told Albert that she, Lel, was engaged to his brother. The grandfather wrote her a very nasty letter. But they said, you're a good woman. You're a strong woman. She didn't vacillate. She didn't vacillate when she came home. She remembered the promises of that nighttime ride when the whole cell was up. And she trusted the Lord. Long story short, they were married. They had children. They had one child, and Albert had had the vision of both the first child, who was Cassie, and the second child, who was Flat D. Lyman III. And in the vision of Flat D. Lyman III, Albert had been in his dream or whatever it was and he's not sure what it was whatever it was he was reading a magazine and it had a picture of, of a big plant with thorns and the thorns were getting caught in the pages and one of the thorns got caught in the shoulder of a little boy that was playing around his feet they moved to White Mesa where Blanding is now and Lel was pregnant with the second child when the second child came Grandpa immediately turned him over and looked on his back where one of those thorns from that magazine had pricked this baby in the vision. And this boy, Flat D. Lyman III, had a bad blue spot on his leg. And as it turns out, this boy had quite a number of problems, word of wisdom problems and so forth, and didn't wake up until after he'd had four boys. 
feel like it was about 38 years old. Then somewhere along the area of 1942. Finally, Grandpa came all of this problem with this boy with the wild hair that he had seen in the vision. <coughs> Listened to it, and Grandpa was taught him true sense. No other way to say it. Say, you don't think any more of your birthright than if you'd been born in a body again. And went back. Flat went back home. And from that day forward, he began to chant the three Sunnahs getting the reports of the wonderful things he was doing. All of the rest of the children followed out as many well as they'd like. Fifteen of them. Well, me died when he was two, but I think he was just a small one. And if you come tomorrow, I can tell you a little bit more about staying there. Some of the most important things in grandpa's life happened in the death of the little boy Dane who was dragged to death by a boat. I'll go tomorrow or <coughs> I have a chance I'd like to. And I feel that Albert R. has said, and he says in this letter, there's a, a letter here that each of you have written in 1969 by Albert R. to all of you, to all of his children, his posterity, and to anyone else who is interested talking about following the prophet. And he very specifically mentions that. As I read that letter again from Anand Jandarila over at Madison Sun, I felt that he said, I want you to tell your Sunday story. That's when I was 72. Brent and uh, he started showing you this picture right here so it's in the rocks is this almost hidden picture of a lady do you see it well that that's to represent that vision that grandpa had that he always uh, referred to as the Lady of the Rocks. And uh, so there are excerpts, two excerpts from that that are on this disc. One tells the story of the Lady of the Rocks and all his life up to that point that uh, Brent was referring to. He was wondering, where's the Lady of the Rocks? You know, <laughs> she's supposed to be my wife but I've married Lel. And then he has this incident with Dane, who was dragged by a horse, and then discovers the answer as to who the Lady of the Rocks is. Anyway, that story is, is on this disc, and there are a lot of other uh, stories. There are other books that are on this disc. Uh, Galloping Vengeance is an unpublished story that uh, Grandpa wrote. And this is the story of uh, Ether in the Book of Mormon. But he envisions how that story actually happened and wrote, wrote the story down. And so that, that book is on this disc. Maybe you've heard of Dick Butt. Dick Butt was the sheriff at, uh, when all of those controversial things were happening in Monticello and they were trying to figure out what on earth can we do <laughs> to uh, resolve these issues with the outlaws and cowboys. And uh, so he wrote Dick Butt's story because he was the sheriff and he happened to be the, the man who came just at the right time into that area to have the temerity and also the skill to confront these outlaws and start bringing uh, justice and security to the people living in San Juan County. Uh, has the story of Lucretia Hancock Robinson, uh, the journal of Eliza Maria, Maria Partridge, and a bunch of other things. There's uh, some excerpts in here of Grandpa Lyman's uh, journal. And it'd be impossible 
to talk about all of his writings. I guess that was the assignment, was to talk about his writings, but this is just one, one of almost a hundred volumes of his journals and, uh, and writings and thoughts. Um, and uh, so there's no way we, we could ever cover everything that he, that he got into. But I thought it would be interesting to you to see a sample of it. Um, so these discs right here are available for anyone who wants a copy. I know some of you already have a copy because I sent some out. But uh, these are di uh, available to anyone who's interested. I have a friend who produced this production right here. It's called uh, Hole in the Rock. And it's, it's one that is, uh, the host is Gerald Lund. Maybe you've seen it on, uh, on TV, on uh, BYU TV. Uh, but anyway, that uh, uh, friend made all of these discs available. And uh, they're available to you at my cost that he charged me, which is nothing. <laughs> so any, anyone who's interested can uh, have a copy of this. Well, uh, Grandpa has uh, a number of interesting short stories. Two of them are in these two books. Th these are LDS adventure stories that Preston Nibley pulled together from different uh, locations. And Grandpa has an, uh, an article, a story that he's written in, in each of these books. And they're both wolf stories. Well, Grandpa uh, loved animals. He, th he thought animals needed protection. And so he raised all of his children to be protective of the animals. And, uh, but in, in the case of wolves, he felt like he had uh, a greater allegiance to his cattle <laughs> than the wolves. And, uh, and the cattlemen down there, they were going through all of the, these problems year after year with the wolves destroying the cattle. And so uh, there were uh, incidences of some wolves that were huge, but very, very cunning. And those stories are each in this, one in each in this, these two books here. One is called Big Wolf, and the other one is called The Lone Wolf. It's, I forgot the other title. But uh, those have been redone, retyped, and digitized on this disc too. But he taught, he taught, uh, you know, uh, Matt said, talk about Grandpa's publications. You can't really talk about his publications without doing <laughs> what Brent did because so much of, of who he was is are in his publications uh, in addition to the great adventure. So he, he composed this little song and he taught it to his children and you've all probably sung it in, in your homes. My mom uh, taught it to us and uh, 